Was there a moment that you recognized that you wanted to be a musician for a career? There's pictures of me at three years old with a little plastic guitar on stage with my dad's band over there in Asheville, North Carolina, playing music again, since I was able to hold an instrument and spent most of my childhood playing bluegrass gigs around Western North Carolina, going to festivals. And then when I was through high school, I'm like, yeah, this is this is it for me. I loved it. And I spent all my time doing it because that's what we did as a kid. I've never done, literally never done anything else with my life. I was also very fortunate to grow up in a town, Asheville, that had a working studio. The studio that we were, that, that was in Asheville, kind of did a lot of the Southern gospel music and uh, kind of bluegrass and country. This piano player, Anthony Berger, was my neighbor, and it was a suggestion of my mom. She said, just go talk to Anthony, see what he says. And he said, yeah, just come, ha come hang out at the studio. So literally from like my senior year of high school, first day, you know, even the summer before then, I would go to the studio and hang out because they were working there all the time. Got to be around the scene, see musicians work. The festivals that we would go to, I would see guys like Jerry Douglas on stage with Tony Rice or doing stuff by himself. I would also, as I looked at records that we had or, or just know that I heard him on, like on a Randy Travis record on the radio, like that's cool. And I no noticed that there were other players from my world Jerry Douglas, Sam Bush, Mark O'Connor, Stuart Duncan, that were like, oh, you can live in Nashville and play bluegrass and also work on records. And I didn't see a lot of acoustic guitar players that were doing that. And so it like, okay, there's maybe a little bit of a niche there for me. And even watching music on TV. And that was an era, beautiful era of music when you had the National Network and the American Music Shop. And you'd see, you know, hours of the act coming on stage. But I was always interested more in like, Leland Sklar and I, you know, I knew those players back there. I want to, I want to do that. I want to be just behind the, the singer, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, and also, you know, again, like my growing awareness of of what a studio was and how you work there. We had made a couple little records in our family band, and so I kind of was intrigued with that whole space. You know, this the the control room and all the gear, and the, you know, it's just it always feels magical. Again, fortunate with that studio in Asheville to, you know, actually got hired for the first session a few months after I'd been hanging out there. One of the other musicians that was doing a lot of work there made a bluegrass record and said, do you want to play on it? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> he also said, do you play mandolin? And I said, sure. And I didn't play mandolin, <laughs> you know, the night before the session, just kind of woodshedding as hard as I could, changing strings on it and all this kind of stuff. That was an early lesson, too, of like, say yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, sure. I can do that. Right. Um, How did it work out? Oh, it was fine. The way that date made me feel, I am with my people. <laughs> I'm doing something that I feel fulfilled by. I feel thankful to know that 30 years or 30 plus years later, it still feels pretty much the same way. Yeah, there's some real life kind of the ups and downs and, you know, the music business kind of stuff rears its ugly head here and there. But to that joy of getting in the car every day and, and knowing that I, I get to go hang out with people that I love and, and play music and and do this. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And so again, from that late teenage years, that's when I, I knew that I wanted it. So did you know that you wanted to be in the studio as mm -hmm. a musician or well, was there an interest in live too? And I knew that it would probably be both. Mm -hmm. I knew, I knew enough, like, again, like to the Jerry Douglas career model of like, that is so cool that he plays at Merle Fest and hangs out on stage with all these different people. And then when he's in Nashville, he plays on records. That's, I want to figure out that for me. And so, yeah, it's always been kind of a blend. I don't know that I've ever looked at just sessions as like the one dedicated lane for me. Mm -hmm. Which I feel like is an interesting thing because with a lot of players, there seems to be at some point a dedicated decision that's made that of like the identity. I'm a live person that sometimes does sessions or I'm a session guy that will do a live thing if the right artist, you know, calls yeah. and that sort of thing. But you've been, it sounds like you've been able to balance those yeah, elements. tried to. It's hard. That's part of the hard part of it. I guess I would ultimately fall on probably more of a localized session player that has been fortunate to take advantage of a lot of really good road opportunities, mm -hmm. not just go on the road because I had to, because it was literally like Ricky Skaggs is calling and I can go play bluegrass with Ricky Skaggs. I knew this is hard. This will be hard to pull off, but let's figure it out. Let's let's do it. The kind of playing that I do on stage playing bluegrass with the folks that I get to play with doesn't happen here in the studio. For me to be on stage, like improvising in a band real time with Bela and Sam and Stuart and, and Jerry Douglas, it's more like me as an artist. That's the appeal and, and the draw there is not just going on the road with somebody. It's, it's like collaborative music with friends of mine and we go out 
you know, like stoke that part of our careers, which again is not music row necessarily as far as the, the characters, the kind of music, the intent and all that kind of stuff. It's still the music business and it's still me, but it is a, it's a different hat. It's not easy. Again, it's like almost diametrically opposed energies at, at times. I love hearing that because I think what it shows is that there's a unique path for everyone mm -hmm. and what you're rooted in is what fulfills you. Yeah. And so, you know, for me to be fulfilled, these two things are important for, yeah. for me. And so I'm going to figure it out rather than just saying, well, what I'm told by everyone is that I have to make a choice to do yeah. this or this if it's going to work. But you said, let me look at first externally at what fulfills me. And then I'm going to figure out internally how I can balance these two things to make it happen because yeah. doing what I love is what's more important. At least for Nashville, what I did kind of recognize early on was some of that stigma. Like you say, you got to make a choice. You're either a road guy or a session guy. I, I, I felt obstinate enough to say, no, I don't, you know, I'm that's stupid. <laughs> Again, another thing that I try to tell people that are interested in any of this kind of work is like, this, this is definitely the era of diversification, you know, whether it be touring session stuff, other things you can do, like for me, teaching or writing, you know, or whatever it is, you know, it's like, just enjoy being a musician. So when you got to Nashville, what were the first steps that you took to kind of find your way into your initial opportunities? Well, again, like the bluegrass community was great to jump into through real public access, like the jams at the station in on Sunday night. I got to meet Aubrey Haney there and some other players, uh, other other folks in the, in the scene from that initial experience in Asheville and some time spent in that Southern gospel world and sessions that I did outside of Asheville, like in Knoxville in South Carolina and up in West Virginia. Uh, again, I mentioned Mark Fain earlier. He had moved to town before me and actually got the job with Ricky Skaggs, great guitar player, session player, Bobby All, that I'd gotten to just know a little bit, kind of like I'd done when I was in high school, of just pick up the phone and say, hey man, can I hang, come hang out? Just come be a fly on a wall in a session. And then there was one, Shannon Forrest, great drummer, his dad, Otis, had actually done maybe one or two sessions with him here just in that kind of before I moved here time. So I did know him. And so, you know, pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm in Nashville now. Through those few little connections, I mean, literally between Otis and Bobby, I think, yeah, I knew two people in the Nashville session world, mm -hmm. uh, just in that sort of small little gospel wing. But again, that was enough to start building, you know, the connections. Everybody realizes when you're in Nashville, it is, it's a pretty small town feel that you – you will eventually kind of run across a lot of people <laughs> mm -hmm. and it just built from there less than a year and a half or two years being here. That's when the Ricky Skaggs job happened for me. And that was, that was a really good thing because it again, ex expanded my awareness and I was doing stuff with Ricky, like at the, the live at the Ryman show where I got to meet people like Paul Lyme and, and Brent Mason and Brent Rowan and David Hungate. And where again, did that Ricky Skaggs gig come from? Well, again, Mark Fain, got the job in April of that year. The guy that I replaced left in July and they needed to fill that slot pretty quickly. Mark was there and said, you ought to try this guy, this kid, he just moved to town. And, and playing with Ricky and, and being in those environments, uh, like the Ryman show and stuff, when you, when you met some of those folks, did those relationships from like, from being on that stage with that band, did that lead to people kind of being more aware of you? And did yeah. you, yeah, like especially Brent Rowan, who was on the majority of those shows, same kind of thing, just said, can I come hang out at a session that you're doing? And to that point, like I didn't say, I want to be on the next date you're on, you know, and, you know, because you recognize too, it's like not every session is going to be conducive to having some kid hang out, you know. For me, it wasn't so much opportunistic, you know, just knowing deep down, yeah, I really want to do this. I want to do this kind of work. What's the best way I can fit into this scene. And part of that too, I would go back to these guys that I got to be around in Asheville, most notably David Johnson, incredible kind of multi-instrumentalist who continues to be a kind of a guru, spiritual guide kind of guy for me. Just like, I think about him so much of like, how would he handle himself in this situation? I guess what you led with was your passion for mm -hmm. music and being a musician. And because of your intense interest in it, mm -hmm. would it be possible for me to hang out and see what you do mm -hmm. instead of saying, do you know any gigs I could get on? Yeah. Or how do I become successful? And you can much more likely end up than someone keeping your mind. Yeah, this kid was so excited about coming in on sessions and I saw him playing with, you know, with Ricky Skaggs and he was great on stage. This producer just asked me about the session. Maybe I'll, mm -hmm. th you know, think about him. But you never had to ask for the, 
you know, the session. No. You just you were just put put yourself in the environment and, and see if you could learn from people. And and yeah. every the thing I think to recognize also when people are a little nervous about even asking like that much mm -hmm. is that we've all been there where where the that person is that wants to get into it now. We were that person yeah. once. And for the most part, I think everybody's pretty much sympathetic to that and and wants mm -hmm. to help others because we remember what it's like to come yeah. into a new town and and know no one or a couple of people and yeah. trying to figure it out on your own you know yeah it seems like that is the, the the sort of chemistry of it and your musicianship should speak for itself and what you do to speak for yourself is more about the person that you are because the likelihood of anybody recommending you for a thing is going to be more based on that equation than just your chops do you r recall where that f where the first kind of big session opportunity came from you and how it transpired and who it came from one of the really big ones again like the advantage of being with ricky skaggs the point that i jumped into his career was a big moment for him just because he was kind of returning back to these bluegrass roots led to you know like me on some pretty visible stages and one of those was what they used to do in nashville called the nammies and Paul Worley was out in the crowd and uh, Natalie Maines, the Dixie Chicks, and they were working on a record and had a song that they wanted a guitar solo on called Sin Wagon. And like, I got a call a couple of days later for me to come play on that through other bluegrass connections, Garth Fundus, and we're talking like through Jerry Douglas and Sam Bush. And Garth has always been kind of really aware of that bluegrass scene. He did all the new grass revival records. And there is generally kind of a crew of of kind of dedicated acoustic musicians, you know, that come from that bluegrass world that are kind of in Nashville, kind of <laughs> uh, intermingling with, with all the other people through conversations with Sam and Jerry. I can't, I don't know exactly that, but I know that I did some early stuff with him as well, you know, to just the demo work. I remember one of the first, when I had left the Skaggs band, one of the first weekends I was in town, ran into Jerry Sally at this church and he, it's literally like, what are you doing this week? Because I think he had a demo session and somebody had canceled on him or something. And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, okay, come to County Q. When that first kind of like demo opportunity came up and you, you come into that situation, were some of the things that you remember kind of learning or recognizing uh, off the bat that helped you progress into, you know, doing masters? And um, well, just the timing of it, you know, recognizing in a demo session, oh, we're doing five songs in three hours. But I was kind of prepared for that because some of those really early gospel days, you know, you'd do 10 songs in a day. That felt pretty common. I wasn't freaked out by that or like I need more time to work on a part. I was pretty aware of what it felt like to hear a demo, look at a chart, go sit in a chair and play it. So if someone isn't there yet, what would you suggest for someone to prepare themselves to be ready for that situation? Promoting the kind of headspace that's necessary for that is to have instruments that play in tune that you don't have to sit there and fool around with. Or if I need this, I have a gust ring. If I need this, I have a high string. I bring a mandolin on along that's in tune. The the gear efficiency, just like a pedal board that doesn't buzz or, or you know, stuff that works. There's no time to say, I need an extra five minutes to change a string because the other one's dead. To the musicianship of it and the playing of it, and this is what I think can lead a lot of session players down a wrong path of just like being safe, you know, too kind of guarded in the whole thing. It's like embrace that process. Something good can happen quickly. Challenge yourself to not overthink. You know, the lesson that you have in this kind of rapid fire is trust yourself. If it's not there, then learn from it. Part of also what you come equipped with is what's being cut in Nashville these days or what's on the radio. You know, what kind of guitars do you hear? Um, or sounds do you hear, that's probably what's going to show up in a demo session and just being aware, being aware of what, even the history of it too, you know, because I know who Ray Eddington was and Grady Martin and Chad Atkins and how they played that at least <clears throat> provides like a historical kind of reference for what can work and make something sound country, uh, versus pop or something like that. Yeah. You know, it's so, also really helpful when when someone producer or artist asks for mm -hmm. says says a reference and yeah. mentions it. You know, mm -hmm. to have enough of that diverse musical history to kind of understand what they what yeah. they probably intend by it. I didn't grow up playing with metronomes and clicks and good drummers and things like that. I would go back and listen, and I could hear all these little recorrections, like just min minute speed up, slow down moments, just because I didn't have to me was like a true agreement with the groove, which was steady but also musical that got into a lot of the mental state of what tiny little bits of tension are in there that's not quite trusting that 
that my note is going to be there where I'm still trying to kind of control it. That's what I heard in all these little recorrections with me was me controlling it. So that that mental exercise of kind of releasing some of that control. There was a book that I got into early on. My mother actually gave it to me when I uh, graduated from high school called The Inner Game of Music. And it deals with a lot of these uh, what's basically focal attention being more what they call internally focused, where I'm doing this thing the whole time. Let's be more externally focused where in my brain, although I recognize that I am making this guitar make a sound, it wouldn't sound like anything if I didn't engage. But to the sort of experience of doing it, my focus is actually on the other side of the glass. What does it sound like coming back? What does that screen look like where if you were to look at the click and the waveforms that are the click and then, and what does my waveform look like that if I'm just in my brain literally like psyching myself out or putting myself in another space. So that external uh, focal attention means that I'm choosing to pay more attention to the effect than the cause. It matters, and especially in a studio world where minutia and nuance and subtleties are kind of amplified. You know, when I rush a little bit into a downbeat of a chorus and the drummer is not, you know, it's flammy. So how can I get out of my own way of like, yeah, this is a chorus, it's going to feel good when I go boom like that that amount of intent and want to quickly reveals itself, you know, again, as a negative when I'm overdoing it, when I say, okay, I need this, this chorus or the entrance into this chorus could build some energy, build some dynamic. I need to understand what's it feel like to hear more volume, but not to, not to hear the rushing as well. When you started to recognize the importance of that, were there any practices that you kind of put into place other than the obvious of just being aware of it? But anything that you like sat down to specifically focus on that would help train your mind to stay in that state more yeah, naturally? I remember uh, uh, Tim Smith, a great bass player that I did a lot of early sessions with, was the first guy that we talked about, you know, like having the click feel like another member of the band and just the headspace of going, okay, what is that? What What does a click sound like? if it were to actually be part of this piece of music, not some external mechanical force that we're all kind of like, you know, laser focused on and like, you know, or feel like we're going to get fired if we rush it or drag it or something like that. Like mm -hmm. let it again, allow it to be a member of the band. Uh, and just that experience of like getting out of your own way. That's again, that's, that's another like bottom line concept is where, where am I getting in my own way in the process of this? A lot of it comes from bass players. Another good friend of mine, Mark Fain talked about the pocket of the vocal like and how it you know if there's a triangulation of what i'm going to play when it comes to the rhythmic placement and things like that where the click is and you've got this very human vocalist and maybe they're rushing maybe they're dragging but it's in a lot of their syllables and a lot of their breath that they're that's the tell that's the that's the key to notice where a true pocket is and what's cool about that is because it's not some piece of gear it's a human um it actually feels really good again to some of those like when i'm able to now go back and listen and hopefully hear something that's not as you know recorrected as it goes but but moves along with the vocal in a way that's groovy that's emotionally connected and in agreement it comes down to listening and trust of your own mechanism when i see a lot of young session players again they're nervous in the first place of just that sort of more performance aspect of the whole thing performance pressures that's a layer of tension the layer of tension that's like i'm getting paid to do this and then to just the performance of the part it's like okay i don't want to mess up you know and so you just hear you know little especially like a finger style acoustic -y kind of thing that's just it's the right notes in the right order and maybe they're pretty close to the right spot but it just sounds kind of stiff it sounds sounds mechanical because they're in such kind of control of themselves. I've always used the analogy of like kind of inching yourself further and further out to the to that part of the limb of a tree that's not quite as sturdy. And maybe it starts wobbling around, but but you got to get used to that. Reading a lot of books and listening to a lot of athletes that fail a lot in front of a lot of people. So that willingness and the vulnerability to fail. Uh, I love reading about, you know, these comedians, stand-up comedians uh, that have just sort of learned to embrace the bomb, you uh -huh. know, like, I'm going to make a mistake, but it's just going to be amazing how huge <laughs> this mistake is. And what's beautiful about that is actually freeing versus this real tight, like, okay, I've got to control this for three and a half minutes, but it's the bottom line. It's going to sound that way. You know, mm -hmm. that that's, it's those little nuances. I mean, again, you can be a really high level guitar player, but at least in this world of, of, of recording studio work and capturing performances that 
we all hope to be musical, especially again, like in the world of acoustic guitar, it needs to have that human element. It needs to have, um, you know, enough groove in it and enough humanity in it that it feels like something. It, 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 it is the song and the part. So when we talk about pocket and, and trusting the vocalist phrasing or where the drummer is landing with modern production in certain genres, a lot of things end up getting gridded up, edited sure. to death, you know? And so if you're on a session where you kind of know that the the style is leaning in that way, how does that perspective kind of evolve a little bit? You understand too, like the, the intent for that music is that, is like this very gridded kind of sound where they're probably going to filter the sound of the acoustic guitar in a way that I wouldn't, you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't buy that guitar that I hear. Uh, when it's all kind of thinned out and hyper compressed and bright and all this kind of stuff, but it works. And again, I think that's to the, just the job of this, of leaving what I would do at the door and my, my job, um, for the next three hours or six hours or whatever is just to be a team player, work with the second engineer in there that's behind the pro tools and say, you know what, that four bars feels like the right loop. I did that two days ago, you know, where I knew all we ever needed was like, here's these four bars that go over and over and over again in the whole song. And that was the part. And so it's almost like over overwork for me to feel like I've got to create some kind of human performance to this track because it's not going to end up that way anyway. Mm -hmm. So do your best to create a chorus <laughs> or a verse that works. And then and again, just it's it's an embracing of the process and an understand that when I'm working with this producer, with this kind of artist or whatever this is going to be, that's that's just what we do. You know, that, that's that been my kind of take on it. Mm -hmm. It's not the way I love to do it. You know, if if I get to make all the shots, you know, it would be done a different way. But would it also be different music and different way to sing and different way to write and all that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes to just what I love to do. But again, that's the point of being a session player is that. As Brent Rowan told me 25 years ago, the producer's right till five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for you, it sounds like you you kind of em embrace that. It, it, was there ever a challenge with coming in on sessions that were counter to your natural tendencies and sort of feeling artistically muted a little bit in what you were being asked to do? Yeah, the lesson is, oh, okay, this, this is not doing something different at the end of the second verse because the vocal went up here. This is like, no, all we need literally is the same thing over and over again. So you ask yourself, do I want to continue to do this? Again, because I do p feel pretty soulfully connected to the music that I've played since I was a kid. That just doesn't happen, you know, in a music row kind of session on average. So it's been a lot of like, oh, it's not this, but it's, it's, here's other things I can love about it. I mean, we all have things that we love to play and we all have a skill set that says we can learn quickly and we can perform this correctly, quickly and move on and, and enjoy the process of making records and living in Nashville. So within the full balance of it all, the lessons have been, yeah, this today, this is what this is. You're embracing a lifestyle that is so varied that, you know, you sort of just see the different uh, sort of particles of the chemistry kind of come together in different ways in different days and different weeks. And and what are the things within that that you love? What are the things that you don't love as much? And at the end of the year, I'm thankful to say in the end of 30 years of doing this now, there's been a whole lot more to love than, than not uh, when it comes to, again, just the process, the people, the you know, uh, musicians, engineers, producers, artists, you know, that's to me, that's, you know, if I had to stop this tomorrow, that that would be the stuff that's like, yeah, even though I had to just commit to four bars of just some rolly part that <laughs> it made the record work and it was great. It's the right thing for the right day. You know, I always looked at session players like um, character actors where it's like, yeah, the, today we need you to wear this suit and a hat and look like a gangster. Tomorrow we need you to wear a, some kind of army fatigues or, you know, the next day you're a lifeguard. And that's what we do is we embrace these characters that make the record what it needs to be. And so you embrace all the things that go along with that. And so that's, you find the joy in those individual things and that helps you stay away from maybe the getting jaded in the moment of. Yeah, I think jaded in the moment and also to the sort of the mindfulness of it. I think there are tendencies with session players to kind of start phoning it in, especially when you play a lot of the same thing over and over and again. That's one of the, you know, maybe complaints about sort of commercial music is that, gosh, all these songs sound the same because they are. And you can fall into this trap of like, well, this is, this is my go-to guitar on this. This is the strum pattern that always works. And so I also see that challenge of like, well, how can I 
within all this balance of everything, kind of keep this interesting to me, find something in that particular moment or that particular group of people in the room that even though we played the same song last week and a whole different crew with a whole different artist, looking for something that's fresh, again, in the moment, not being kind of stuck in the rut of just like, okay, here's this whole thing again and one, five, six, four, and, and here's what I do on that or here's the go-to guitars. Considering kind of the acoustic chair as, as sort of like a section in the orchestra where you can kind of create uh, little trios, little sections where it's not just one guitar, but it's a guitar and a 12 string doubling it, or like these little parts that you can create with like a resonator, a mandolin or a high string or something like that. You know, the kid that enjoyed putting stuff together with Legos, that that's sort of what that feels like. I got this great group, you know, collection of instruments and just creating little combinations, even though this song is so bland, <laughs> like here's something I can throw on this. So I enjoy that where it's not just like, here's this, this bland every day is the same acoustic guitar part, but an opportunity just to continue to find something in the moment, responsive, reactive, creative, you know, and all the different sort of manifestations that that might take place. With the psychology of the producer and musician relationship and the communication that happens, if you were thinking the producer probably wants the obvious thing here, but I want to try something to help add some more creative diversity within within this. Do you say anything beforehand or do you just go ahead and do it and then wait for the, the response? A lot of times I'll say, here's A, here's B, and they'll know immediately like, oh yeah, it's this. Uh, or if not, they'll say, let's remember this for a while. I mean, I, I, I'm i not beholding or holding myself to some, I've got to nail this, you know, in two minutes to make myself look really cool. Like I, like I got this, I'm willing to kind of let it be wrong for a minute or, or just find itself after half an hour of, of running some things as it figures itself out. I am not afraid at all to own it and say, if you want me to just make a decision, fine. If you want to be part of it, I'm way happy to ask you and you tell me exactly what you want. Again, you're right till five o'clock. In the early stages of getting into sessions, sometimes people feel like they almost have to say something to sh mm -hmm. show their worth or yeah. to give sort of, you know, some sort of perspective of, yeah, I belong here. And how have you learned to navigate that when you, how to recognize when nothing needs to be said and you need to just let it, let things, you know, kind of roll versus when it could be worth it to yeah. sort of say something. And there's a psychology about reading the room and, you know, sure. the, all every characters and the situation and all that. Uh, you know, it, you know, with the song, from the demo listen, I mean, even in the early days, if it was one of these sort of classic country sounding things where the acoustic guitar kind of came out of the gate with some kind of rolling kind of hooky pattern, you know, maybe all I got to do is just learn that and perform it in a way that's consistent and in time. Nothing needs to be said about that. It's on me to, to nail it. And yeah, there's pressure, especially as a young guy. Uh, young player to say, oh, okay, I'm in a room with pros and these people that have more experience than me. And it's, it's, it's a pressure cooker, but that's, you know, with a lot of the stuff I said earlier, that's, that's, that was kind of my experience there of like, how can I be better at this? How can I not feel like that I'm under the gun all the time? How can I enjoy this? It's going to be okay. <laughs> There's probably a reason you got hired in the first place. There have been sessions where I felt like, you know, this is just not something that's I can do as believably as the writer. That's the other thing is, is there may be some kind of intrinsic little charming thing about the way the writer played the acoustic guitar part on some pawn shop gut string. I have my hands in my instruments and my sensibilities, and I'm never going to sound like you. That's been part of the challenge from the early days to, to even to now of like trying to get that every man kind of sound and not to say that I'm, you know, I've got these chops of God or anything like that. But we, but all professional musicians are very, very capable. And, and especially to the acoustic guitar parts, a lot of times and piano parts too, that are very kind of pedestrian, but that's also the cool charm of the song. So recreating that has been a challenge. And again, that's why I like to the character actor, like I don't need to be some kind of lifer acoustic guitar player professional. I need to sound like some kid in a, in a, you know, at the, at the bluebird and his first, you know, songwriter around and he's nervous and, or whatever it is, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's why, again, I've got guitars with dead strings and, and willing to make mistakes and things like that. Because uh, again, sometimes the charm is in the most simple, the most bonehead, uh, or simplistic kind of thing. We overwork ourselves a lot, you know, that, that need again, like to prove your worth. 
usually means you're going to overdo it and, and, and learning to underdo it. I think that's really that's that classic studio session trope of it's not what you play, it's what you don't play kind of thing mm -hmm. that really does ring true as far as me and other players that I've seen that feel like we got to come out of the gate and like show off or anything like that. It's like, whoa, that is way too much. You know, all we need is this like more of what's on the demo. And, and that's challenging is, you know, to kind of undo right. what I know that I can do, what I would like to hear, what's kind of cool for, you know, all the guitar pickers out there. But that's not what the song is. It's not going to be some complex, fancy thing that even though I can do and it might make me look cool um, in the room, in the moment, it's not serving the big picture. And certainly to the to the industry of it, not going to probably not going to get me hired back as much as me being able to play the right part. When you think about how you're actually approaching the playing of the guitar. Is there yeah. anything that comes to mind that kind of helps it pull back into that restrained uh, place? Uh, well, just a lot of listening to that. Again, not just to the chart and the lyrics on the demo, but how is that if it's if the demo is played just an acoustic guitar? What is kind of the, the energy behind that? If it's really sloppy, let it be really sloppy. Let it be buzzy. Notes die. You know, we think about these sort of pristine acoustic guitar parts where all this this sound is, you know, bigger than the room and right in your face and huge and, and whatever. But that's not like Keith Richards or Willie Nelson solos are a great example of that, that, that kind of fly around pocket timing, note choice that's wacky, but it's charming as, as it ever needs to be. There are a lot of versions of what is good, what is right, what works for a song. And if that means that I need to have some buzzy notes because the song is about some kind of sad, I'm at my wits end heartbreak and the guitar part needs to fit that and not be some kind of <laughs> over complex, glorious sounding kind of thing. Were there any lessons that you learned from the, the first kind of masters and like bigger sessions that you got brought into that was, um, that was something to be helpful for someone that might be gearing their way towards some of those yeah. situations? My particular experience with that was was a good dose of the imposter syndrome early on, especially, you know, like here's this young kid and you feel like, wow, they're taking a risk on me. Why me? Why not hire some, you know, more established person? You deal with that. You got to get over that. Do um, you get over it or is it more that you learn how to manage it? You learn how to manage it. And experience teaches me that, yeah, I, there are things that I can trust in my musicianship and my choices. Part of the management gets you to the point of experience that you can trust whether it be this world, again, in my bluegrass world, where a lot of the big gigs that I've done has been because Tony Rice couldn't make it or somebody died and, and like suddenly here comes this new kid. But yeah, you, you learn to manage it. And as you manage, you build experience and that experience and manage, manageability kind of start going hand in hand. But, you know, on the master side, you're dealing with a little more ego. You're dealing with a little more of this, like, here's an actual artist with, a, with maybe a, two, two things, like either a track record of hit singles or two or three other records that kind of did this. So again, know that, you know, I still do that. Like I'll go, even if it's an artist that I've worked on, go remind myself what the last record sounded like. Um, what guitars did I use? What was kind of the, the direction there? Um, or if it's a brand new artist, you know, what, what, are, what are we really aiming for? And how does that contrast other things that are on the radio? So with the master intent, like that means... I need to play something that sounds like it's going to be on the radio. Also knowing too, to the, you know, again, to just classic session player uh, mentality of like, no matter what, I'm there to serve the song, to serve uh, an artist and a producer and help a vision for something be seen. I'm a, I'm a team player. As Tom Bukovac says, it's a service industry. It can get a little tenuous at times. It can get like, we're not sure, you know, we'll spend three hours running around the block to get right back to where we started. And sometimes they just need to do that. You can have too many ideas. So seeing that happen, seeing players tell the drummer what their part should be, <laughs> hearing back, you know, when you're hired to play drums, you know, you can, you can come up with this, but you're, you're not hired. So <laughs> just ways to present that, that aren't so heavy handed. Again, maybe I say, you know, this, this could be, this could be the worst idea of the day, but what if, you know, what if I did this, you know, me and Jimmy Lee Slos did this on the guitar and bass front, put the, put the one over a five and, you know, whatever it might be, you know, where I'm not going to tell, hey, Jimmy, you play a five on the bar three of the chorus. And not to make the dance so delicate either, but just know that, you know, you're dealing with humans and I've seen it done the right way and the wrong way enough of, you know, because we're collaborative, because we're sharing ideas and trying to see this thing through, there's a way to do that where we all win. 
you know, or there's a way to do it. You need to say this because it makes you look good. You know, that's to the players interaction with each other. I think that's, that's a big lesson. Embrace that humanity, embrace the vulnerabilities and the personalities that are in there, either on this side of the glass, our side or the other. There's a lot of versions of what can be called right in, in music. Producers or players that think they have the right way. You know, a producer's paid to sort of make that decision and that's fine. And again, you're right till five o'clock because we've all been in situations where like, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll spend 45 minutes to an hour building a part to only hear, you know, now we're going to, you know, we need to change this. That's what we're in for. One of the things that I've noticed a lot in your in your in your playing and records that you've played on is parts that are extremely memorable and also just very tasteful and having like a, a hooky element built within it, but still allows the vocal and the artist to shine. Is there a practice to that or sort of figuring out that that balance of, of creating something that is really memorable while still fitting into the scope of a, of a modern you know production? Yeah there's usually something within the melody, just some, some, as I listen to how the verse goes or how the chorus goes, at least to say, okay, here's a little kernel on, kernel on this path that I can kind of follow and see where that goes. And that'll oftentimes kind of, as it all comes together, reveal some kind of part, whether it be a strummy thing or a, or a role that kind of has hopefully those elements, some kind of like the part that felt like it was there to begin with, you know, it kind of defines the song in some way. And I'm not really thinking so much about this particular melody line, but just kind of how it all, how it all, how it feels like the song. Would a listener believe that this is part, that this acoustic guitar part is part of that melody? And I think as long as you're listening for it, the lesson there for anybody is just, if, if you, if you intend for it, if you listen for it, again, you might not notice it at first, but there'll be something there. There always is. Even if it's a, a, a very limited kind of harmonic kind of melody, that's that's a motif. The fact that the melody has three notes, hey, you've you've got four that you don't have to worry about in this key. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's that's the clue. It's so that's what yeah, you know, like the little kernel on the path, or like what does it feel like to put some of that together, and what do you get? Obviously, all of this stuff is kind of from learned experience, and mm -hmm. we learn these, and some of it is just absolutely instinctual, but some of it is learned instinct. Yeah. Is there, is there anything that you would suggest for someone to start to build some of those instinctual things about what does make sense for, for the song when you're listening yeah. to Yeah, we've got so many decades of, of uh, examples. You know, I think about Don Potter's playing on all the Judd's records, James Taylor, Blackbird, you know, Paul McCartney as a, as a pretty clear kind of connection of a guitar part and a melody working together. Obviously, that all came together at the same time. But as a player looking for that kind of stuff, studying studying history. You know, if you're trying to speak a certain language, you go study the vocabulary. You know, the Eagles records, especially to the acoustic guitar chair, uh, Eagles records, bands like America, Mark Cass Stevens' first chord of Friends in Low Places. It's the fact that those notes come out and then there's space. It's the space. It's what he doesn't play. He doesn't feel like I've got to make some kind of fancy, you know, move to that next diminished chord. As a theme, as a motif, it defines itself as it goes. It's not Mark Cass Stevens trying to be fancy and and get all this flourish of of one thing or another. It's extremely simple. Being able to just be aware that there is a big picture here that is beyond you and your particular skill set or desires on this instrument. I see Garth Brooks on stage and people hearing that chord and knowing immediately what it is. Like, mm -hmm. how can we create that? Like, that's what working in commercial music is about. So what sort of things do you do to prepare your mindset for sessions to be able to have the clarity to yeah. recognize all of these nuances and, and put something great on a record? Definitely don't need to drink too much coffee. Sometimes I like to listen to music that has nothing to do with what I'm doing too. You know, I'm a big fan of like just listening to solo classical piano. You know, if I listen to music by Daryl Scott, he's a musician to me that only needs a guitar in his voice. I like to think to some of those things we're talking about, like a, a guitar part that is the song, not just a hook, but like it integrates itself with the melody and the singer in a way where if that's all you had, would you really feel like you needed all this other stuff? That's an intriguing idea to me. It's like, is, is there a guitar part or is there a marriage of, of those two things coming together where that's all you needed? So as a session player, are there any exercises that you do to maintain your mobility and, you know, playing and stuff? 
on a record date, I might go out to my spot a few minutes earlier and just kind of sit with the instrument and play a little bit or those parts in the morning where the engineers get in the sound, like play something really hard. I've got a few pieces of music that I play that really stretch, you know, fret hand kind of stuff. And, and also to the acoustic guitar chair, the physicality matters because it's the difference in something that sounds clean or something that sounds real squeaky and kind of gnarly. Are there any exercises you would recommend for someone that's trying to improve their skill sets as a studio player? I like the idea of playing something that's probably harder than anything you're going to do that day where everything you're going to be playing is easier than what you know that you can actually do. If I'm sitting in front of a pair of KM54s run through a Neve that's been brightened slightly, if I squeak the least little bit, you're going to hear it. Or even fingers lifting off strings or how the thing resonates or a slightest little buzz back in the headstock. That's what you're dialing in is that clarity. And again, to like to the athletic stuff, like all the nuance and minutia of like a golf swing or a baseball pitcher, just so many little things can go wrong. If you're trying to fight to avoid those, you're probably going to create those. So part of warming up is getting loose and, and you know, getting your mind set and focused. And again, hopefully not too much coffee and, and just taking some deep breaths. That's a big one. You know, monitoring your heart rate, not sitting there tight and cold on the instrument and the drummer counts it off and you start moving. Even if nobody wants to hear it, if I start hearing a click, I'm going to be moving along and doing something to know that my entrance into a song is not jumping into the cold deep end of the pool, but a runway. So when it comes to uh, little buzzes and squeaks and noises, uh, are there any things that, that you recommend to either avoid those from a playing standpoint or from a treatment of the instrument standpoint? If I've got a capo high up on the fretboard, say I've got a capo on the sixth fret, I'll put another capo, not squeeze down a lot, but just enough to kind of mute the strings like on the third fret kind of midway between the capo and the nut. If there's any buzzing back there, just extraneous kind of zzz, it can tamp that. And because you've got a capo midway in the neck, that's a lot of ringing. And there's sympathetic kind of ringing there and also behind the nut. So if you see me play in most situations, you'll see a capo behind the nut, not just because it's a convenient place to put the capo, but because it, uh, it, it mutes tiny little bits of extra stuff ringing it can help your guitar sound more in tune. If you're playing in a key and those sympathetic ringings are a half step or a quarter tone sharp or flat than the note that you're actually trying to get, your guitar will sound more nailed when that's muted. You know, so you, you, I know enough about the instrument and how to look for the buzzes, you know, and where they're probably coming from in my situation uh, to know what to do to stop them. Yeah, I think it's important too, I mean, to get deeper into the nuance, but not really. Because it's a big deal to understand how how to tune again, uh, an acoustic guitar. You know, where I tune for the key that I'm in or the capo position. Don't just tune a guitar open and then throw a capo on and start playing. Uh, especially if that position that you're playing in involves like a D shape where that third is up on the top. If you do that, it's gonna it's not going to be in tune with the chord. It's going to ring sharp. And so understanding kind of just order of harmonics to the point of thirds that even though the tuner says it's right on, it's if you sweeten it flat a little bit, it's going to be better. It's just going to work better. So you're oftentimes finding this just right amount of, of the sweet spot or the balance for everything you need to play. But that's going to change on the next song or change when your next part, when you move the capo. I'm tuning, not because I'm out of tune, but because I am continually calibrating that because again as you play the guitar warms up the room cools off with the air conditioning or whatever it's going to be and, and again it can seem like minutia but at the end of the day it's the success of the part or not so you've been doing teaching for for quite a while creating really great series of uh, of instructional videos across a wide range of aspects and earlier you were telling me a bit about your thought process around the psychology of learning mm -hmm. for a musician that's trying to maybe expand their skill set to be a better session player what sort of advice would you give or what is your thought process around how you can expand your abilities on, on the instrument? To the sort of stages of learning is accepting that none of us know what we don't know. And the next stage beyond that is you just learn about what you don't know. So you have to be open, being open to receiving new information from people. And sometimes that's hard, especially if you're on a gig and you're, you know, you're feeling this pressure or whatever. So just, you know, knowing that that, that process has to happen, you have to be okay with all that. You have to be okay with being nervous. You have to be okay with operating while you, you're not sure what's going to happen. 
be willing to fail a few times and, and know that we all do and that's okay. Embrace your own humanity as you learn those things. And when you recognize that there is something new to learn and you go out and you begin um, trying to figure that out, would you say that the focus is more on the very like theory-based technical aspect of it or the how you fit that theory thing into a song? And how do you find the balance between those two things? Well, yeah, for somebody that already knows a lot about one thing, but you've got to expand that to be able to do this other thing. I mean, for me, I grew up playing nothing but bluegrass. And if I wanted to make a living doing any kind of session, it means that I've got to learn to strum with a thin pick. I actually got invited to leave an early session in South Carolina one time because I couldn't do that. <laughs> and they wanted this real classic kind of Ray Edenton smooth strum. And I just didn't have that in stock that day <laughs> and learned. You know, if, if you're like a Berkeley grad and want to move to Nashville and get into sessions, your Berkeley chops are great. You know, don't deny that they're, they're awesome. But if you're going to play on a country record in Nashville, it's more like what you said earlier. It's like, what can I learn about the style of music that's done here and the way it's made and the way it's crafted in a studio? And what are those players doing? What are those parts? How do they all work together to create that sound that I'm listening to? I'd never done much finger picking outside of like Chet Atkins kind of style when I was a kid. So studying James Taylor and just absorbing all, all these different ways to play an instrument. That's really what feeds in. It's not that one thing that you do really well, but how can I be really aware of lots of different ways to play the guitar? Because you, you just don't know what you're going to get into on any session. So looking back on your career, if you were to take a bumper sticker and slap it on your cartridge rig, <laughs> what what do you think it would say that would uh you know define success as a session musician? Uh that's a hard question. I might say uh survivor, <laughs> uh nice guy, um willing. <laughs> um survivor still seems to work pretty well. Probably that balance thing. Again, I, I'm uh, I'm a tried and true Libra and to me it's always about all the elements that are out there and finding some kind of cohesion uh, and and evenness and balance to the bigger picture lessons outside of just the the work of being a musician for me it's also a family and being present as a father and i mean that's that's as or more important than any note that i'm going to play and it matters again i think to a lot of good young players who have defined a lot of themselves based on their talent you know, when you have a kid, thankfully that that's going to change. They don't care how well you play the guitar or what your last cool part was on a, on a hit record or what, what your bank statement looks like the way that can truly balance a life, especially in this world that is mildly to severely competitive and, and, you know, you're, you're as good as your last session, you know, as far as how, how on time and how, in tune you you know you were and you know <laughs> it's it's like being a pro, pro athlete where you feel like am i slipping am i losing it when my life feels balanced i'm happy well thank you so much for doing this with us i'm so grateful that oh, you man. came in and, and did this this was such an incredible conversation thank you thanks i for feel asking. inspired <laughs> well good thank you me too